Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kat Pangeli, Community and Engagement Manager for Lean Agile Global 2021. In the lead up to the live virtual conference being held on 24th and 25th May, I will be introducing you to some of the fantastic speakers that we have in our lineup. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Cheryl Hammond, aka Basket Case, Principal Consultant at Contino. Uh, hi, Cheryl. Welcome. Happy to have you here. Hi, Kat. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, so I've prepared five questions for you today. And to start it off with something fun and a bit simpler, how would you describe yourself in a single tweet? Oh, God. <laughs> the, uh, they've given me 240 characters now, and I don't know if that makes it harder or easier. Very true. Right? <laughs> but like my taglines run along the lines of like, you know, I, I really am a true believer in the principles of Lean and Agile. And I almost never implement that the way people expect. Uh, and I think one of my taglines on one of the many sites that I have a presence is troublemaker and people kind of notice that, right? I just, I like, um, I like to create healthy amounts of chaos and disruption um, while being as absolutely good to the people involved and trying to at all times use lean and agile to make people's jobs better we spend okay. so much of our lives at our jobs and we all need that experience to suck less than it currently does Love that. and there's just there's so much we can do so yeah. i think that fits in a tweet well we'll have to we'll have to type it out and see what happens <laughs> maybe we need some emoji Yes, that is fair. I love that. Um, I love that you said, you know, you're a troublemaker, you identify yourself as a basket case, you know, I love that because those are really words that you wouldn't necessarily think of in a positive light originally. Um, but I love how you just say, you know, you want to make people's jobs better by creating a bit of chaos, shaking things up a little bit and, you know, genuinely creating, um, you know, lean and agile spaces for people. And I love that. Cool. I think it comes a lot from, I, I've worked as off and on as a consultant and then also inside of organizations, but I think my consulting background gives me that kind of outsider's view that if, if I'm in working in an organization, chances are the things that you are trying to do aren't quite working the way you intend. And you're looking for a little bit of an outside voice to, to say, let's think about this piece differently. Yeah. And and so that that's something that I enjoy doing. I'm I like being the kind of consultant who is helpful and supportive along that journey and who's encouraging you in a direction that you already want to go. Um, and and so that kind of work I find just really rewarding. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it makes a really big impact on people because I always find that you know, you can think about something forever. Um, but as soon as you bring someone else's brain, a different brain, a different way of thinking into it, um, it just, it changes the whole dynamic of it, right? You know, their job, um, you know, maybe going a certain way, they may have certain ideas. And as soon as you bring someone else in to say, okay, you're going to do this today, or this is how it's going to go. It really gives the opportunity to create growth. Right. And I love that. Right. Yeah, fantastic. Well, um, that was a great start. Absolutely loved hearing about that. Um, so moving more towards the conference then, in your opinion, why should people come and join us virtually at Lean Agile Global? Well, it's an opportunity that we don't often have to see the some of the greatest thinkers in the Lean Agile space without being constrained by geography. And so I know, you know, I have, I, I usually have to self-fund to go to conferences and I'm, I'm not sponsored and my employer typically doesn't pay for me to go. And so I'm pretty limited in what I can choose to go to when we're doing in-person stuff. And I have to think about where is it, how much time can I take off of work and so on. So having the opportunity to get speakers of the caliber that you have at this conference accessible to us at you know, uh, you know the the conference price point, and the fact that we don't, I don't have to be able to afford travel to London or Amsterdam or you know somewhere on the continent. Absolutely. Much as I would love to visit such a place. Yes. <laughs> it, 
it's not something I can always just pop off and do. Absolutely. And I've for years watched really extraordinary lean and agile conferences and gatherings that happen on another continent that are just not accessible to me and thinking, you know, I don't even, I don't always even know how some of these people can be able to go to as many of them as they do. I suppose there are people who look at where I get to go in the US and think the same thing. And so this is really knocking down some of those borders. Um, and when you look at the roster of speakers, you know, when I first, honestly, when I first got the invitation to submit a proposal, I wasn't familiar with this conference because I know the ecosystem on my own continent pretty well, but less on others for the reason I just mentioned. And I went and just glanced at some of the names to say, like, I don't know, you know, you, you get the LinkedIn spam, you want to, you know, sometimes those things are real and pan out and sometimes they're not. And I glanced at just a few of the names of the organizers and I said, oh, whoa, 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 this one's legit. Good. I this love that. The real deal. I really want to be a part of it. So awesome. I'm really excited to be able to be involved. And I think there are so many folks that, um, again, like North American audience or Asia Pacific audience might not be as familiar with some of the European based speakers that you have. But I know that you're also doing the work to pull in speakers from globally to take advantage of basically the exact same thing from the organizer side. Yeah. Um, and so it's an opportunity that we really don't typically get. And um, you know, and, and once things reopen and we're back to traveling as normal, we don't really know what that's going to look like for conferences in the future. So to me, this is a dive on this now while it's there. Absolutely. And it fits so beautifully into a workday. I can manage going to a session and then doing remote work and then going to another session. So it limits the amount of time I have to take off. And like, it's just super flexible and it's going to fit really well in all of our lives, I think. Good. And that's fantastic. You know, I'm really happy that you said it's kind of opened the opportunity for you to meet, you know, agile workers across the globe, because that's really what we were hoping to accomplish was to be able to, to, you know, connect everyone. We wanted it to be a really diverse and inclusive conference. And we wanted, you know, diversity to not just be with, you know, people from across the globe, but thoughts from across the globe and ways of working from across the globe. So I'm really happy that, you know, you feel that way and that it's kind of given you the opportunity to, to network with a group of, a group of people that you otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to network with. Absolutely. I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Good. Um, well, as I kind of just mentioned, we really want LAG um, to be a diverse and inclusive conference. Um, and I'd love to know from your perspective, what does that mean to you? I think it really, for me, the important thing is elevating the voices of people who have typically not had a platform in a traditional agile community setting. And I think the best way for me to think about that is to look back at the signers of the original Agile Manifesto. That thing is turning 20 years old. And when we look at the, even the photo in the background on the Agile Manifesto website, that is a bunch of white dudes. Yeah. <laughs> and there is really no one who looks like me who's represented at that conference. And there is certainly no one who looks like a person of color that I am aware of that's in that list of signatories. And so for decades now, literally decades, we've kind of been given this message that the best and brightest minds in the agile community are white dudes, you know? And this is not to take anything away from the fact that they were smart people who did smart things. But if you think about the example of something like, um, we just rewatched the film Hidden Figures, which is about the, the black women who supported the space mission for NASA yeah. and who were mostly invisible and not treated well while doing that. And there are so many wonderful stories of women in the very earliest days of early technology, way before even you know software was a thing, who, uh, and, and other forms of sciences who contributed tremendous amounts and were never recognized. Yeah. So it's, it's, there are groups now that are digging into the question of what about the women in the early days of Agile who were contributing just as much important thought work into the Agile community as the signers of the manifesto, but who were not recognized in the same way. Yeah. And oh, yes, some of us have heard of them. But when I say not recognized in the same way, that's what I mean. You yeah. know, not in the same way. And so we think about, well, that's also an event that occurred in North America. And 
did not have a global perspective. It was not bringing in workers from, you know, there were it, from other countries or other regions. And so now, today, 20 years later, I think our community has grown. And it's not that we're magically discovering Agile in other parts of the world. It's that what we're doing is making connections with the people who have already been doing that work yeah. without the recognition. And we are bringing, making an effort to reach out and expand our community to include the people who are already smart and already solving problems in a novel way in tech and in industry using the principles that we, you know, that, that we espouse. And we're trying to get that together and figure out what can we learn from them? We're not bestowing agile and lean concepts to the world. We are taking them in, synthesizing them, turning them into something new, and we're sharing them for everybody to use. Yeah. And so it's, it's a great opportunity for us who've been, you know, I talk about, okay, well, women weren't, didn't have a voice in that early process, but in many other ways, people who looked like me have been well represented over all these years, uh, North American and middle class and, you know, pale skinned and, you know, it, it is an opportunity for me to go see what can I learn from, you know, the men and women in India, the men and women in Africa who have a that have developed their own communities and their own practices. And yeah. it's going to make me a better practitioner. Um, and so the, again, we're at a point in history, I think, where we are doing a better job of recognizing that we can, that someone like me can attend an event like this. And yes, I'm thrilled to have a talk, but I'm more excited about the opportunity to shut up and learn from other people who are going to expand my practices. Yeah. Absolutely. I love, I love that entire perspective that you have, you know, that it's the opportunity to learn. And, mm -hmm. and I love that. And it's, it's really true that, um, as I kind of mentioned before, bringing the thoughts from around the world, you know, there's going to be the exact same practices used in completely different ways, you know, um, I know this is your video, but to speak to a quick another talk that I think you'll be yes. quite interested in is um, two um, of the ladies in Africa are doing a talk called Agile in the Wild, and it's how mm -hmm. they've used Agile in the ways of wildlife conservation in Africa. And it's just, and I was like, that is so interesting. I would have never considered that that is a way to use Agile, but that's what their talks about. And it's, and it's a real life story of how they went out into the savannah, into the desert, and they used mm -hmm. Agile in, in, in wildlife yeah. rescue. And I was like, that's fantastic. Well, that's, that's like one of my favorite things about the community is when we encounter someone who's a member of our community talking about lean agile principles, but also has expertise, like real expertise in some other field. Yeah. And so it's not, it is, it goes beyond just taking our lean and agile practices into that field, but it's about what do we learn from someone who is functioning at an expert level at wildlife conservation? What yeah. are some of the principles that they follow that might tap into what we're thinking about or might inform our practice. Absolutely. So it's not just saying, here's another case study of a different environment. You know, it's not like, well, we've used it in banking and healthcare and, you know, other and entertainment. It's saying, what can we actually learn from the, the methodologies of wildlife conservation yeah. that could make our practices more humane, more sustainable, better for the planet, right? It gives us a yeah. new, a, a couple new angles of thinking that we might not if we were heads down in traditional software industry. Yeah, I love that. Right? And so it, that it happens to also be a perspective from Africa and it happens to also be perspectives from women is gonna give it so much more dimension, but it's that, that bringing in from other disciplines I think really helps us mature our own thinking. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, well, so talking about talks, then uh, I want to hear a little bit about more, more about your session. So <laughs> why should people come to your talk at the conference? <laughs> All right. So we're going to go from talking about wildlife and saving the planet and yeah. maturing our thinking to underpants. <laughs> underpants. Underpants. So yes, my talk is based on a fairly well-known episode of South Park that includes characters that are called the underpants gnomes. And the principle of the underpants gnomes is that they have a business plan. Their business plan is to collect underpants, 
phase two of their business plan is, we don't know. And phase three is profit. <laughs> and I recognized kind of a long time ago, because that is not a new episode. Yes, um, no, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure that's an episode from my childhood. <laughs> oh, you're hurting me right now. But, Sorry, my yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I recognized early on when I was, um, I was teaching Kanban in fairly early days of teaching Kanban. And the experience that I found um, with a lot of the folks that I was working with and coaching was that everybody understood, and I think it is still true, everyone understood that the idea behind Kanban is to have a Kanban board. And so you want to put up your big visible display and you want to visualize your work. And people are okay. They're pretty good at that, right? We all get the idea of let's have a board. And nowadays we have so many technology tools. We have a lot of tools that provide virtual boards. People use Trello, people use Jira, people hate one, love another, whatever. <laughs> But after they've done the work to put up the big visible display, I saw that oftentimes teams did not know what to do next. Yeah. And so the idea of Kanban felt like we're going to put up the phase one, put up the board. Phase two, we don't know. Yeah. And phase three was then things will be better. Yeah. And phase two is, as you might expect, phase two is doing all the work there. And so what I wanted to do is have a conversation that is lighthearted, but really gets to the heart of what happens when you put the board up, the magic transformation does not happen mm -hmm. and you're not clear what to do next. Um, frequently we talk about sort of canonically, like, okay, you get someone who knows a little bit more about Kanban and they'll say, aha, but phase two is limit width. And I say, well, yes, yes, it is. And I tried that <laughs> and it didn't work. And then I really wanted to unpack, well, why didn't that work? And so then this talk is where we're going to explore. You may have had an idea for what your phase two was and you may have tried it and then it stalled or it didn't work and you don't know why. Or you may have just gotten stuck and not been able to do anything for phase two. And so the talk is going to explore very simple, very concrete things, um, just boom, 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 down a list of stuff that you can try to try to jumpstart phase two and get actual transformation happening. Awesome. Um, it's, it's got goofy slides and gnomes and piles of underpants and it's lots of fun. Uh, but at the heart of it is trying to have some very concrete, simple things that anyone who comes to that talk is going to be able to switch off the talk, turn on their next Zoom meeting and start trying immediately. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And I love that you, you know, it's such a, I don't want to say technical thing, but you're literally, you know, telling them tasks that they can do, but you make it sound so fun. You That's know, you make I'm it sound so fun for. and entertaining and exciting. And and I love that, you know, to, to bring some passion and into in excitement into such a, into such a topic, I think is really, if you got me excited and I'm like, oh, that well, sounds so well, fun. I'm going to be there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the heart of it, we are trying to solve problems that are bugging you at work, yeah. right? It's things that are making your job harder in some way. And so I want to help you figure out how to bust through that without having to pay an expensive consultant. Like there's stuff that you probably already know that we can tap into to get you moving again. Yeah. And that feeling of movement and forward progress is so satisfying. And I think as we're, so many of us are still sitting here at home doing these remote meetings, we're literally not going anywhere, yeah. but feeling like we're making some forward progress, I think is really, really rewarding. And so I hope everybody will come out of my talk with that sense of, we can do this thing. Yeah. It may be very small, but we can do a thing and see that it helps us. And that's going to feel great. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, I love that. Well, I really hope that you get, you know, a good amount of people at your talk and people genuinely oh interested God. and ready to, to kind of engage with that and take it on board and go away excited to tackle the work that they have in front of them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, to wrap it up then, this has been a great conversation. And so to take it a little bit away from the professional side, it's more of a personal question. I'd love to know what you're most looking forward to doing once COVID has started to settle down. 
Uh, see, this is another, it's another one of those questions that's kind of tricky because, so I saw a tweet go by um, maybe a few weeks ago. Um, I haven't been able to find it again, but it, it said something along the lines of once this, once the pandemic lockdown is over, there's going to be two kinds of people in the world. There's going to be the, like the hedonists that are running out there to take everything that they've missed the last year. And then there's going to be those of us that are permanently agoraphobic. And I was like, <laughs> Team agoraphobia right here. Like, Love it. No desire to leave this wonderful room. It's very comfortable. It has everything I need. But the, the truth is I did love traveling and I loved traveling for work. Um, I love going to the places where my clients do their work and understanding more about them from their surroundings. Yeah. And from, I'm, I think my, my specific answer is I am most looking forward to getting back to eavesdropping on my clients again. I love it <laughs> because I learned so much from just being present in a client's office and taking in what's going on around me and understanding what they talk about and what they don't talk about and trying to really get a sense of what are their lives like so that I understand how best to support them and what their goals are and what, what their next step on their journey is. So I think I do... I do miss that you can't get that incidental contact in, a, you know, scheduled Zoom calls in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's amazing. I, you know, I really appreciate it. You can tell that there's a big passion for your clients as well. You know, you have, you truly love your clients and want them to succeed. And I love that I can, I love that I can feel that from you, even through such a short conversation. So that's great. That's awesome. Thank you for that. That's, yeah. that's the nicest kind of feedback. I love that. Thank you. Good. Well, I'm very happy with that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. Really appreciate your time and taking the time out of your day to talk to the people that will hopefully be attending your session and the conference. I know where I'm going to be <laughs> when thank you're talking. You. I will definitely be there and uh, hopefully everyone will be able to join and, and take away those key things that you mentioned and take it back to their work and succeed, which is what we're yeah. hoping for with everyone. Yay. Piles Yay. of underpants that will help you work better. Love it. It's good. Well, Can't thank you so it. much, Cheryl. <laughs> thank you so much, Kat. It was great talking with you. You too. Thanks.